people of different religions disagree about what medicine can do and what it should be allowed to do. When should doctors be able to stop us dying? Should they be able to stop us being born? Today, they're sometimes seen as opposites, but in the past, medicine and religion more often worked together. The ancient Greeks, who lived over 2,000 years ago, believed that illness was often caused and cured by the gods. Very few sources survive from the ancient Greeks, but from the buildings, vases and statues that are left, we can see what was important to them. This is a reconstruction of a building on the Greek island of Kos. It was the nearest thing the Greeks had to a hospital, but it was actually a temple to the god Asclepius, the god of healing. This is a description from a carved stone tablet found in a temple. A man had an abscess in his stomach. He came to the temple and he fell asleep. He dreamed that the god Asclepius ordered servants to grip him tightly. Asclepius cut his belly open and removed the abscess, then stitched him up. He was cured, but the floor around was covered in blood. These pictures of gods such as Asclepius survive because so many of them were made. But they don't tell us the full story about the Greeks. People had many different beliefs about illness. Historians say medicine was almost like a marketplace, with different healers offering different cures. Physicians, exorcists, bone setters, surgeons, herbalists. Doctors disagreed amongst themselves. The choice of which cure to try was left to the individual patient. Patients tried anything and everything, and often religious healing was only used in the worst cases. About 400 BC, some Greek doctors were writing about disease in a different way. They said disease wasn't caused by the gods. Over 60 written works survive from these ancient Greeks. They're called the Hippocratic Corpus, because for a long time, people believed they were all written by one man, the Greek doctor Hippocrates. In fact, historians now think the Hippocratic Corpus was the work of several different doctors. These doctors discussed how illness was caused and how it could be cured. They observed the patients carefully to try and find out what caused disease. This is one case they wrote about. It was a case of epilepsy. The boy had these symptoms. In winter he was sitting by the fire in the bathhouse, being rubbed with oil. Suddenly he had a fit. When the fit stopped he looked about. He was confused and could hardly speak. We took him to the temple. They called it the sacred disease and said we were to wait. They said they wanted to see him when the fit took hold. When it came, it was like usual. He was foaming at the mouth and kicking with his legs. Do you remember? Th they said that Ares was visiting the child. Ares the god. You hear that, Simeus? How can they call themselves religious men when they believe the gods would do this to a child? And if he'd screamed out in his fit, they would have said, it is the god Poseidon, because he's neighing like a horse, and Poseidon rides a horse. 
And if he'd passed small turds, they would have said, it's Apollo. For the god Apollo loves birds, and these are like bird droppings. It's nonsense. What did they recommend? Uh, they said he should not place his feet one on another. And he should not hold his hands like so. That's all. And he should not wear goat skin. Nor eat turtle dove. We can't even afford turtle dove. For the Hippocratic doctors, epilepsy, like any other disease, had natural, not supernatural, causes. One of them wrote, It's only because this disease is so different from other diseases that people think it's caused by the gods. People view these fits in ignorance and fear. But this disease is a natural disease, and those that call it sacred are witch doctors, faith healers and quacks. He's sleeping. What will you do with him? Oh, you will watch. We will watch not just his fits, but his whole person. We will note how he speaks, his silence, his, his manner. How he sleeps, wakes and dreams. We will note if he sweats or shivers, his chills, coughs, sneezes, hiccups. His breathing, belching, his wind. And then we will mull over the significance of all these signs. If a fit is coming, you'll know, because he feels it. He takes himself into a corner and pulls a blanket over his head. Why do you think he does that? Uh, I thought to fend off demons. Or simply shame. Why shame? Perhaps he is ashamed that you think he's possessed by demons. These doctors weren't against religion, far from it. What they rejected was the idea that the gods could cause disease. The gods, if anything, would make people well, not sick. Thinking like this made them search for other, more natural causes of disease. They began to notice how the body gets rid of fluids, sweat, urine, mucus, earwax. They wondered what would happen if these impurities stayed in the body. Would that cause disease? They wondered about the effects of diet and exercise and heat and the weather and the wind. And they wrote down what they observed. The Hippocratic Corpus records case histories, snapshots of illnesses over 2,000 years old. On the second day he was seized again. Fits, some foaming at the mouth. On the third day he couldn't speak. On the fourth day he fell, and from then on he spoke with a stutter. On the fifth day his tongue was severely affected. The fits came on and he was beside himself. On the sixth day, as he did not eat or drink anything, there were no further fits. From their observations, Hippocratic doctors came to conclusions about the human body. They said that a healthy body is a body in balance, and that when the body was out of balance, it was sick. Too much hot or too much cold, too much wet or too much dry could cause sickness. They believed epilepsy was caused by too much cold, wet phlegm, blocking the air from moving around the body. It shuts off the supply of air to the brain and to the blood. The numbness that you feel when you've been seated too long is the same effect, but in this case it causes a fit. He loses his voice and he loses his wits. We are all unstable creatures. We are all liable to get ill. And a dip. Equals. 
with no evidence the methods were any more effective than others in the Greek medical market. Wealthy, educated and fashionable Greeks. Plato, the philosopher, praised Hippocrates. If you want to study medicine, go and study with Hippocrates of Kos, the greatest doctor of all. As the Greeks spread over the Middle East and beyond, they took the medical ideas with them. Greek ideas were written down and ended up in libraries across the Greek world. And then, in about 300 BC, when the Romans began to conquer the Greek world, they took on Greek ideas and spread them even further through the Roman Empire. Galen was born 500 years after the Hippocratic doctors in what's now Turkey. He spoke Greek, but for 40 years he practiced in Rome, in Italy, where Greek doctors were considered to be the best. He treated the emperor successfully and became Rome's leading doctor. We still have his autobiography, which he wrote because, he said, so many inferior doctors were passing off his work as their own. I was walking along. I met this man surrounded by a crowd of fools. He was saying, I've met Galen, the great Galen. He's taught me everything he knows. He was peddling cures for toothache. Toothache, he said, is caused by worms in the teeth. And he had this ball of pitch, which he lit so it smoked. And he stuffed it in this poor man's face, forcing him to screw up his eyes. And when they were tight shut, he slipped these worms into his mouth and pretended to draw them out. Ta-da! They were so impressed, they wanted to give him all their money. I said to them, I, ladies and gentlemen, am Galen, and he is a quack. And then I had him taken and flogged. Galen was a show-off, but he was also a brilliant doctor. This 16th century illustration shows him soon after his arrival in Rome, performing a public dissection on a live pig. His aim was to show the doctors of Rome how far his studies had advanced. Do you know they still believe the heart controls what we do? It's the brain controls what we do, but only if you make the cut can you prove it. So, I had this pig strapped to the table. I sliced into its neck and found its nerves. It was squealing the whole time. I said, watch, when I cut this nerve, It'll squeal. I make the cut. Again, when I cut this nerve, again, it'll squeal. But when I cut this nerve, the pig will no longer be able to squeal. And I cut, and the pig's completely silent, proving the brain, not the heart, controls speech. Everything they believed, in a moment. Galen's aim was to explain everything about the body, the purpose of each part of the body, what the heart, the brain and the liver do, and how they all work together. He turned medical thinking since Hippocrates into one system, a system which became very powerful and then influenced Western medical thought for the next 1400 years. But Galen had a problem that hindered his development as a doctor. He needed to study the body inside as well as out. In ancient Rome, Cutting up dead bodies was simply not done. It wasn't forbidden, but few Greeks or Romans would have dreamed of interfering with a corpse. It was an example of religious beliefs holding back medical progress. You have to study human bones. I don't mean study in books. Even my books, which granted are by far the best. No, I'm talking about real bones. Skeletons. Seeing them with your own eyes. Touching them. Understanding how they move, how they fit together. It's difficult, but it's not impossible. Galen had studied medicine in Egypt, where, after death, priests removed the body's internal organs as part of the funeral preparations, and where his teachers had been able to show him skeletons. He told his students to go there too. But back home, seeing the inside of a human body was more difficult. How could he do this? I was doctor to the gladiator school for a while. That was good. All those fit and well-muscled men slicing into each other. I got to see inside some very interesting wounds. 
Galen also used to search for big family tombs with the marble doors broken so that he could get inside. I'd spent hours lost in excitement, fixing myself on what I was seeing, determined to remember every bone, every joint. How I'd have wished to take one of those skeletons to have with me when I wrote, to make sure my account was perfect and free from mistakes. Though Galen claimed to have seen human corpses, the evidence suggests he never did an actual full dissection on a human being. Instead, he had to rely heavily on dissections of apes and other animals. And it meant, despite his brilliance, he did make mistakes. He wrote that the left kidney is lower than the right. Correct for an ape, but not for a human. He described the womb, but in fact he was describing the womb of a dog. And because religious beliefs made dissections difficult, it was hard for anyone to challenge his work, or to prove he was wrong. In his lifetime, Galen wrote over 250 books, and because he was writing at the centre of the powerful Roman Empire, his ideas spread. But today, only about half the writings have survived, and they are copies of copies of copies. Galen wrote Greek, but some of his books survive today only in translations, in Arabic, Hebrew or Latin. This is partly because, after Galen's death, the Roman Empire became less and less powerful. In 410 AD, Rome was sacked. The Romans no longer ruled Western Europe, and their civilization fell apart. This meant that medical study was badly affected. There were fewer libraries and schools. Transport was not safe, so scholars didn't travel. Fewer people had the money and time to study. A very important consequence was the separation of the Latin and Greek languages. The eastern and western halves of the Roman Empire gradually split apart. Greeks no longer understood Latin and Romans no longer understood Greek. So many Greek medical ideas were not studied in the west. The Greek language, Galen's language, survived in the east. When the Arabs conquered the eastern part of the old Roman Empire, Arabic scholars discovered Greek books and translated them into Arabic. From 832 to 900 AD, hundreds of Greek writings on medicine and science were translated into Arabic. Western scholars wouldn't be able to read these books for another 200 years. In the West, Christianity was also encouraging medical study. Monte Cassino was a monastery in southern Italy, which was gathering together one of the finest medical libraries in Europe. The work of the translators here was important in bringing Galen's ideas to the West. One of the translators was Constantine the African, a Muslim who later converted to Christianity. Early in my life, it seems many years ago now, I was a merchant. I was a Muslim. I was a merchant. I traveled. And I came to Salerno in Italy for the first time. I had some interest in medicine, always. I had some skill. I could tell measles from smallpox. I had set up my stall, and I was talking to a doctor from the monastery nearby. When I asked him, out of curiosity. Did they have many books on medicine in Latin? Well, he said they did not. I did not speak Latin at this stage, but it seemed to me here was a great emptiness where they should have been learning. So anyway, my travels continued to Egypt, to India, to Persia, and my studies continued. And I read many works of Greek, which had been translated into Arabic, which was my language. And three years later, with these books, I came again to Italy. Ah, it was a fearful crossing. There was a storm. I lost some. But at last I arrived. A Muslim still. 
at the gates of the great monastery of Monte Cassino. In my bag, a work of Galen, the great philosopher, and others besides. And they welcomed me. They had heard of my scholarship. And I became a Christian and wore Christian clothing. And I set to work, learning Latin and then translating into Latin works on fevers and on the stomach and on the eyes. For 10 years now I have continued and I hope for my great effort I will have earned some reward for my soul. Between 1070 and 1087, Constantine translated many texts from Arabic into Latin. Latin was the language used by Western scholars, and so the works of Galen and others could be understood by doctors here for the first time. Before this, only a fraction of the ancient medical writings were known in the West. In the 12th century, more and more of Galen's work was translated by those who came after Constantine. One of the few pictures we have of Constantine is this woodcut, made 400 years after he died, but its existence shows how important his work was to later scholars. It shows Constantine sitting around a table with two other figures symbolising the coming together of Arabic, Jewish and Christian medicine. The Christian church, like the Muslims earlier, liked Galen's ideas. They fitted with their own beliefs that God created man in his own image and that the human body was the best possible design. The Christian church preserved Galen's ideas and passed them on to the new universities that sprang up in Paris, Bologna and Oxford. Without these translations, Galen would just have been a name and few people would have read his work. Because of Islam and Christianity, Galen's ideas continued to affect medicine in many ways, a thousand years after his death. Religion sometimes held medicine back. Beliefs in supernatural causes stopped people from looking for natural reasons for illness. But religion also helped medicine. Temples and religious houses were often the only places where the sick were treated. Religion preserved information and encouraged scholars and continues to be linked with medicine in many ways.